let's discuss Chinese and Western medical thought, illnesses and its causes in TCM theory. The cancer. No other life-threatening disease is as common in causality complex as cancer. Some cancers are associated with, with specific pathogens such as the human pap papillom papilloma virus for cervical cancer, the helicobacter pylorus for stomach cancer, and the hepatitis B virus for liver cirrhosis, a fatal form of liver cancer. Other cancers are associated with living habits, smoking with lung and pancreatic cancers, and still others with environmental pollutants, insecticides with nasal pharynx cancer. There is also mounting evidence that the genetic factor, as in breast cancer, emotional stress, lymphoma, and high-fat diets, prostate cancer, exert significant influence. The interpretation of statistical evidence for the impact of these varied factors on developing a malignant tumor is a treacherous enterprise, as these factors exist together with the host of others that are potentially relevant. Setting up any kind of clinical trial to identify principal causal agents for specific kinds of cancer inevitably involves value judgment from determine, determining the choice of factors to be included in the study. Such value judgment would be influenced by considerations of medical efficacy. That is by the judgment that in a given set of social and geographical environment, these causal factors that are controllable. This seems evident in the much cited epidemiological study published by nutritional scientist Colin Campbell at Cornell. Based on a 20-year epidemiological investigation of a large number of population samples in various regions of China. The study concluded that a high animal protein diet, which includes diet, dairy, product, meat, and fish, was the most important cause of many forms of cancer, as well as of cardiovascular diseases and diseases. Population samples in a poorer part of China that had very little animal protein in their diet showed low levels of certain cancers. Even when people were exposed to a higher level of carcinogens compared with those from other regions with high animal protein diets. For example, it was found that children fed on peanuts contaminated with the fungal product aflato aflatoxin associated with liver cancer showed lower incidence of liver cancer if they came from regions where little animal protein or dairy product was consumed. As peanuts are an unimportant source of protein and carbohydrates, and as the prevention of fungus molds forming on peanuts require impractical amount of refrigeration and storage facilities. The more effective alternative would be to discourage consumption of peanuts among populations with higher levels of animal protein in their diet, or to discourage the consumption of animal proteins. From this point of view, the principal cause of liver cancer in children is a diet rich in animal proteins. In using the methods of science to investigate the causes of disease, biomedical science is influenced by the values, interests of the medical researcher and political and policy makers who seek the optimal use of economic resources to achieve the objectives of health policy. The theory choice in medicine is a value-laden, as some have argued it is in science, applies equally to TCM. Chinese medicine emphasizes the building up resistance to illness, as pointed out in the aporism, Shen Chi Konei She Buk Ke Gan. <laughs> if the body is rich in healthy qi, it will not succumb to external pathogens. In TCM terms, it would make more sense to regard the presence of rhinovirus in the body as the definition of cold rather than its cause. From the viewpoint of preventing colds, it is more useful to say that the cold is caused by exposure to weather and a weakened body defense system. 
because you can do something about those, but very little about rhinoviruses in the air. Alternatively, taking the causal pile approach to emphasize the segments of the causal pile relating to climatic and lifestyle favors would be more pragmatic and value-driven. Likewise, from the TCM point, uh, viewpoint, excessive emotion and inappropriate diet and living habits are the root causes of cancer rather than unusual cell growth and the rapid multiplication of cancer cells. The latter describes the mechanism by which cancers grow and take root, but not the conditions that cause the cells to behave in this abnormal manner. From a biomedical viewpoint, the conditions that led to a higher incidence of cancer are carcinogens, genetic factors, and stress. This in turn can be related to diet, living habits, and emotions, pointing to an intersection of TCM and biomedical theories of cancer causation. Thank you for your attention. We continue with interviewing techniques still on stools. Loose stools and diarrhea. It is important to differentiate between an acute and a chronic condition. Acute diarrhea will be due to invasion of exogenous pathogenic chi and will thus be an excess condition. In acute conditions, it is important to differentiate between heat and cold. An invasion of damp heat will cause the stool to be explosive because there is an excess of chi present. The stools will also be strong smelling and sticky, and there will be a burning sensation in the rectum due to the presence of heat. If the heat is very strong, it will cause blood to rupture the vessels in the intestinal walls, resulting in blood in the stools. Damp heat can be a chronic as well as an acute condition. The symptoms will be the same, but the etiology will be different. If the stool is very watery, does not smell, and contains undigested food particles, it will be due to invasion of cold, which is an acute condition, or spleen and or kidney yang deficiency if chronic. If it is an acute excess condition, the stools will also be explosive and the abdomen will feel cold and tense, and there will be a cramping pain. Tension and pain will be alleviated by passing stools. Yang deficiency can manifest with the passing of watery stools early in the morning. The person will often feel exhausted after defecation. When there is spleen chi deficiency, the ingested food will not be transformed as it should, so the food will pass more quickly through the intestines and the person will have a bowel movement soon after they have eaten. If there is spleen yang deficiency, there will be undigested food in the stool because there has not been a transformation of the food. The stools will also be watery when there is spleen yang deficiency. Neither spleen chi deficiency nor spleen yang deficiency will manifest with stools that smell strongly. Inquiry should be made about which foods affect the stools negatively. Strong spices, alcohol, fried food, sugar, and dairy products will have a negative effect on the damp heat conditions. Spleen chi deficiency, spleen yang deficiency, and dampness will all be aggravated by consuming raw vegetables, salad, too much fruit, cold food, sugar, sweets, dairy products. If there is a lot of gas in the intestines and the person has flatulence, this will be due to liver chi stagnation, spleen chi deficiency, or damp heat. Damp heat flatulence will be odorous. Explosive diarrhea signifies an excess pattern. Acute condition is excess pattern. Chronic condition, deficiency pattern. Passing of stools shortly after eating is spleen chi deficiency. Passing of watery stools early in the morning kidney and spleen yang deficiency, burning sensation in the rectum and sticky, strong smelling stools signifies damp heat. Watery stools containing undigested food particles, yang deficiency, excess cold, cramping pain that is alleviated by the passing of stools, liver cheese stagnation, sticky stools, damp heat, bloody diarrhea, damp heat, toxic fire, pain or tension that is alleviated by defecation, liver chi stagnation, damp heat. Intestinal discomfort that is alleviated by the passing of stools is excess condition. The condition is aggravated by consumption of alcohol, fried food, dairy products, sugar, and dried fruit, damp heat. Condition is aggravated by consuming salad, raw vegetables, fruit, cold foods, dairy products, sugar, sweets, and dried fruit, 
spleen chair deficiency, spleen yang deficiency, dampness, alternating diarrhea and constipation, normal stools, is liver chi stagnation. Condition improves after the passing of stools, excess conditions. The condition worsens after the passing of stools, deficiency conditions. Thank you for your attention. We continue with diagnosis according to pathogenic chi. Let's now talk about internally generated wind. The difference between internally generated and exogenous wind is that internally generated wind arises as a consequence of Zhang Fu and blood imbalances. Invasions of wind are seen when the body is invaded by exogenous pathogenic chi. This difference is extremely important in relation to treatment strategies and treatment techniques. When there is exogenous wind, you must open to the, open to the exterior and expel pathogenic chi. When there is internally generated wind, you must extinguish wind and treat the underlying zang, zang fu or blood imbalance. Wind in the body is similar to wind in nature in several ways and it can be just as destructive. There may be a slight breeze that just manifests with symptoms such as ticks or a mild dizziness, or it can be like a hurricane and cause paralysis, spasms, and stroke. This is particularly the case when the wind has resulted from heat. This can have a very destructive and sometimes fatal consequences. One of the major problems with wind is that it can whirl up phlegm and send it up to the head, blocking the orifices. This can result in the person losing their ability to talk and make the tongue stiff. The phlegm can also block the channels and result in paralysis. Some of the disorders medicine that are manifestations of internally generated wind of tetanus, febrile convulsions. Wind can cause gentle movements, such as when a flag flaps gently back and forth on a summer's day. But it can also make the flag stand rigidly in the air not moving to either side, such as in an autumn storm. In both scenarios, it is characteristic that the flag's movements are involuntary, and this is the same in the body. All the involuntary movements of the muscles and all forms of cramping and spasm will be due to wind. Its etiology will depend on specific imbalances that have led to the generation of internal wind. For the symptoms and signs, symptoms can be mild, such as tremors, ticks, numbness, and dizziness, and can be more extreme, such as loss of consciousness, aphasia, extreme vertigo, coma, convulsions, and paralysis. There will also be symptoms of the underlying imbalance. For the treatment principle, we extinguish wind and harmonize the underlying imbalance. In our acupuncture treatment, we may choose from acupuncture points do 20, do 16, UB10, GB20, and DIVER3, as well as points to treat the underlying imbalance. Our kneeling technique will depend on whether it is a deficient or an excess pattern of imbalance. Balance. Prefer the explanation to 20, to 16, UB10, GB20, and liver 3 all come in extinguished wind. Uh, the advice to be given to patients will to summarize internally generated wind can be caused by the following patterns of imbalance invasion of exogenous pathogenic chi, liver fire, ascending liver yang, liver yin deficiency liver blood deficiency, and in turn, it can result to phlegm wind. Thank you for your attention.
let's discuss diagnosis according to the six stages, four levels, and the Sanjiao. Uh, we have the historical overview. The three diagnostic theories, diagnosis according to the six stages, diagnosis according to the four levels, and diagnosis according to Sanjiao, are three separate theories that explain how diseases arise and develop after the body has been invaded by exogenous pathogenic qi. The three theories explain both the mechanism of the disease, and at the same time, they are used as a template to determine the level and location in the body where the pathogenic qi is present. The theories are used to analyze the relative strength of the pathogenic qi. In relation to the body's same qi, the anti-pathogenic qi, as well as giving an idea of the direction of the disease is moving in, whether there is an improvement or deterioration in the condition. Disease is a, a dynamic process. It is something which is constantly changing and developing. This means that the treatment strategy must also be something that is being constantly adapt, adapted to the much to match the situation, taking into account the current situation and in which direction the disease is developing. The three theories are not contradictory and are used in different situations, depending on, among other things, the character of the pathogenic chain. The theories can sometimes also be used alongside each other or consequently depending on how the situation develops. It requires flexibility in one's mindset and the ability to let go of the Western medicine either or men mentality. For the historical overview, even though the three diagnostic approaches of the six stages, four levels, and Sanjiao all charts the development of imbalances resulting from the invasion of exogenous pathogenic qi. The first approach is more than 1,500 years older than the other two theories. The oldest theory, which still has great relevance to this day, is the theory of the six stages. This theory was formulated by one of the Chinese medicine's most important figures, Sang Hong Jing in 2020 CE in the classical text Sang Han Lun, Discussion on Cold-Induced Diseases. This book is still one of the cornerstones of Chinese medical education in China. The herbal formulas from this book are still some of the most used prescriptions today. Sang Hong Jing analyzed how the initial symptoms of an invasion manifest and how the symptoms develop depending on the relevant strengths and relationship between the body's Seng Qi and the pathogenic Qi. It describes how disease can develop from exogenous pathogenic Qi penetrates via the energetic aspect of the body that are defined by the six great channels and their corresponding organs. Tai Yang being the most superficial and exterior aspect and Joy Yin the deepest. Sang Jung Jing explained the body's fibril reaction and the corresponding heat signs as the result of the struggle between Seng Qi and pathogenic Qi. What had been the catalyst in the development of Sang's work was that within 10 years, two-thirds of the inhabitants of this village had died in epidemic, especially cholera. This made it both imperative to find cures, but it also provided a rich basis for observing how diseases evolve, how the symptoms change from day to day, and observing whether various treatment strategies work in practice. Even though the treatment approach set forth in the Sang Han Lun was very effective, there were, however, also holes in the theory, and this became more and more apparent, especially around 14 to 1500 CE, when China was plagued by several epidemics, including the bubonic plague. Sang Hang Jun's theory assumed that the body had been exposed to climatic influences, especially cold. His theories could not explain how people could infect each other just by their mere proximity to each other. 
it could also not satisfactorily explain how symptoms manifest with heat from the very beginning. Ji Tian Shi devoted his life to studying fibril diseases. His theories were published after his death in the classic text, When We Doon, the classic of heat diseases. In this model, disease is differentiated in relation to four energetic levels. The deeper the level, the more severe the condition. It introduces for the first time the concept that exogenous pathogenic qi can be transmitted from person to person and that exogenous pathogenic qi can invade the body via the mucous membranes in the mouth, nose, and genitals. The invading pathogenic qi will be energetically hot from the beginning, which means that the symptoms manifest as heat and rapidly injure the fluids in the body and injure yin. The theories in Wen Ri Lun were further developed in the book Wen Bing Tiao Bian, the text on differentiation and treatment of heat disorders, written by Wu Ju Tong in 1798 CE. In his work, heat disorders and their development are analyzed in relation to a Sanjiao model instead of four energetic levels. Thank you for your attention. For treatment principles, we continue discussing tonifying upright chi and expelling the pathogenic factors. In interior patterns, the strategy of expelling pathogenic factors first and tonifying upright chi later is used whenever the symptoms caused by the pathogenic factors are severe so that they need to be dealt with. A very common example of such a situation is post-viral fatigue syndrome. In this disease, there is always an underlying deficiency, but also usually dampness. It is a dampness that causes the tiredness, feeling of heaviness, digestive symptoms, and muscle ache. It is nearly always necessary to start the treatment by resolving dampness without tonifying the upright chi. This approach applies particularly if herbal treatment is given. Another example, patient with chronic kidney and heart young deficiency, suffers an acute episode of total retention of urine leading to hypertension and edema. In this case, the pathogenic factor is water overflowing, causing edema and retention of urine. Since this needs to be dealt with without delay, one must first expel the pathogenic factor. In this case, water overflowing by using a reducing method on spleen 9, stomach 28, REN 9, REN 5, bladder 39, bladder 22, as the lower burner is in an excess condition. After the edema is resolved and the urinary function restored, one can tonify kidney and heart yang. Another example, a patient with a chronic condition of liver blood deficiency has an acute episode of liver wind causing temporary spasm of a cerebral vessel and a small stroke with temporary giddiness, numbness, paralysis of mouth, and slurred speech. In this case, it is essential to eliminate pathogenic factor first, the liver wind, by using reducing method on liver three. Only when liver wind has been extinguished and the symptoms of it are gone, can we tonify liver blood. Strategy of expelling pathogenic factors before tonifying upright chi is not only applicable in acute and urgent cases, but also in chronic cases where the symptoms do not have a character of urgency, but are nevertheless distressing and painful. For example, a patient may suffer from a chronic deficiency of liver and kidney yin, leading to rising of liver yang. This would cause severe headaches, as well as dizziness, irritability. Although the symptoms are not acute or urgent, the headaches may nevertheless be extremely painful and distressing. It is therefore necessary to subdue liver yang first and then tonify liver and kidney yin. In conclusion, in interior patterns, the strategy of uh, expelling pathogenic factors first and tonifying the upright chi later is very widely used. In particular, we prefer to use this strategy in cases of dampness, phlegm, and blood stasis. So, expelling pathogenic factors first before tonifying upright chi is used when the clinical manifestations of pathogenic factors are pronounced 
and causing painful and or distressing symptoms. It is a widely used strategy in interior and exterior conditions. Tonifying upright chi and expelling pathogenic factors simultaneously. This is a widely used approach in cases when there is a pathogenic factor and the upright chi is relatively weak, but not so weak as to need to be tonified first. This approach can be used only in interior conditions, as in exterior conditions, it is usually necessary to expel the pathogenic factor first and then tonify the upright chi. Thus, this strategy is used in cases of uh, mixed deficiency, excess interior patterns. Many examples could be given. If there is a condition of liver yin deficiency with rising of liver yang, one can simultaneously tonify liver yin and subdue liver yang. In case of spleen chi deficiency leading to formation of dampness, one can tonify spleen chi and resolve dampness at the same time. From the acupuncture point of view, this involves using reinforcing method on some points and reducing method on others. In the two above examples, one could tonify kidney three, spleen six, liver eight to nourish liver yin and reduce liver three and GB43 to subdue liver yang. In case of spleen deficiency with dampness, one could tonify bladder 20 and stomach 36 to tonify spleen chi and reduce spleen 9 and spleen 6 to eliminate dampness. The strategy of tonifying upright chi and expelling pathogenic factors simultaneously is used when the upright chi is deficient and pathogenic factors are evident but not so much as to require expelling before tonifying upright chi. Thank you for your attention. Let's continue with according to Zhangfu, or about lung and heart chi deficiency. There is a very close relationship and cooperation between the lung and the heart. They support each other in their functions. And lung chi is used to circulate blood around the body and in the heart. Heart blood nourishes the lung. Furthermore, both the lung and the heart are dependent on zong chi. Therefore, a chi deficiency condition of either zong or zong chi or lung chi or heart chi can result in this pattern. Now let's take a look at its etiology. There are two main etiological factors in this pattern. One of the main elements will often be emotional imbalances that affect the lung and heart. Grief, sorrow, and melancholy will have a negative impact on both organs. Grief, sorrow, and melancholy bind and stagnate lung chi and thereby song chi. The stagnation of song chi will have a negative effect on both the lung and the heart. The heart will also be weakened by lack of joy that is characteristic for these emotional conditions. Overexertion generally exhausts chi. When chi deficiency arises, all organs in the body can become chi deficient. Excessive talking and overusing the voice directly burdens on chi. People whose work require them to use their voice a lot since they need to develop these patterns and signs. There will be palpitations, shortness of breath, a weak cough, insomnia, being easily startled, tendency to have sorrow and melancholy, lack of joy, depression, poor posture, a hollow chest, fatigue, um, low or weak voice, reluctance to speak, fatigue in their voice, pale face, spontaneous sweating, pale tongue in a weak pulse in both soon positions. The key symptoms here, weak voice, disinclination to talk, sunken chest, palpitation, weak tune pulse on both sides. 
for the treatment principle with tonify lung and heart chi. For our acupuncture treatment, we may choose from points REN17, lung 7, lung 9, heart 5, heart 7, pericardium 6, UB13, and UB15. We use the tonifying needling technique and moxa can also be used. For further explanation, REN17 tonifies Song Chi, Lung 7, Lung 9, and UB13 tonify Lung Chi, Heart 5, Heart 7, Pericardium 6, and UB15 tonify Heart Chi, and Calm the Shen. Lung and heart chi should be tonified on both the emotional and physical plane. On the emotional level, it is important that the person tries to address the emotional issues that may be present. It is important that the person cultivates joy in their lives. They can try to spend some time each day doing something that gives them pleasure or sit and meditate on something that they associate with joy. Lung chi can be tonified through the use of breathing exercises and fresh air in general will be salutary. Tonifying chi will also benefit the patient, which could be done through the diet, fresh air, enough rest, and avoiding overexertion. Like exercise, yoga, tai chi, and qigong will be beneficial in the upper jaw. This is important as the deficiency of heart and lung chi can also lead to a stagnation of chi in the upper jaw. So to summarize, lung and heart chi deficiency can be caused by the following patterns of imbalance. Lung chi deficiency, heart chi deficiency, spleen chi deficiency, kidney chi deficiency, gallbladder chi deficiency, heart chi stagnation, blood deficiency, and damp phlegm. In turn, this can result to heart yang deficiency, heart chi stagnation, lung chi deficiency, spleen chi deficiency, damp phlegm, heart yang deficiency, and heart blood deficiency. Thank you for your attention. Let's discuss diagnosis according to eight principles. Deficient code. Deficient code arises when there is insufficient yang to warm the body. The symptom picture will be characterized by physiological processes that are taking place more slowly or less effectively. There will be a poor transformation and transportation of fluids and the food that has been ingested. This will manifest with symptoms such as edema, loose stool, or diarrhea with undigested food particles, berberigmi, lack of thirst, and frequent urination with copious amount of clear urine. Chi production will be diminished due to the poor transformation of the ingested food, air, and gene. Fatigue and lethargy will be therefore be key symptoms. This las lassitude will be both physical and mental. The person will often have slow, ponderous movement, possibly dragging their feet, and they will have a poor posture due to the deficient yang failing to rise the body, raise the body upward, and counteract gravity. The person will feel cold and will freeze easily because they lack the necessary yang to maintain the body's warmth. Unlike a person who has exterior excess cold, a person who is young, deficient, cold will be able to maintain a sensation of warmth in the body if they wear sufficient clothing. It is therefore a diagnostic sign of young, deficient, cold when a person is not noticeably more warmly dressed than others. They may, for example, be wearing a sweater when everyone else in, is in shirt sleeves. We must always be observant of whether a person attired is appropriate for their surroundings as this is a reliable way of diagnosing heat and cold. The arms and legs of a person who is manifesting young deficiency cold often feel subjectively cold, as well as feeling cold when palpated. 
This is because there is not enough yang to circulate in the extremities. At the same time, there is a lack of heat in the in general, and the priority of the body is to keep the internal organs warm and utilize yang here. There will be frequent urination of copious amount of clear urine because fluids are not being transformed and transported and instead are seeping down to the lower gel and because there is not enough yang to hold the urine inside the urinary bladder. The deficiency of yang can also result in food and liquids that have been ingested not being optimally transformed, resulting in watery diarrhea containing undigested food and berberigma. A person who is a deficient cold will have a preference for hot food and drinks. This is one of the ways that the body tries to correct the imbalance. Wei Qi is an, is an aspect of yang. When yang is weak, there may be spontaneous sweating or sweating on light activity. This is because Wei Qi will not be able to keep the pores in the skin closed. Likewise, there could be a tendency towards frequent invasion of exogenous pathogenic qi, especially when cold. For the geology, deficient cold rises when yang has been weakened. Yang is weakened by repeated invasion of cold, excessive consumption of food and drinks that, are, that have a cold dynamic or are physically cold. Medicine that has a cold dynamic such as antibiotics to bad sex, old age, chronic illnesses, and physical exertion such as too much sports. For the symptoms and signs, mat, white complexion, aversion to cold, cold limbs, slow lethargic movements, poor posture. Physical and mental fatigue, frequent urination with copious amount of clear urine, loose tools or diarrhea with undigested food in the stools, no thirst, edema, preference for hot food and drinks, freeze easily, wears warmer clothes than necessary, slow, deep, and weak pulse, pale, swollen, and wet tongue. For the key symptoms, there is aversion to cold, frequent urination, fatigue, deep, and weak pulse. Treatment principle, we have to warm and tonify the young. And for the acupuncture points, choose from do four, kidney three, kidney seven, UB 23, REN four, REN six, REN eight. Needle technique, we have to tony, we use tonifying, moxa is recommended. Explanation, UB 23, do four, REN four, kidney three, and kidney seven, tonify and warm kidney young. REN six and REN eight, tonify and warms young. Relevant advice, if there is deficient cold, the person should eat food and drinks that are both physically and energetically warm, such as garlic, plum, venison, basil, chestnut, shrimps, walnuts, and so on. They should try to utilize cooking methods such as baking and grilling, which are more warming than steaming and boiling the food. Small changes in the diet can also often make a big difference in the long run. They will, for example, benefit from eating lamb instead of, instead of pork, and we can recommend that they use warming spices such as cinnamon, cloves, ginger, curry powder in their cooking. Furthermore, they should avoid foods and drinks that are physically and energetically cold, especially in the autumn and winter when young is most challenged. In practice, this means avoiding eating fruit unless it is boiled or baked, avoiding salad and raw vegetable, and drinking cold water. Although they are physically hot, mint tea, chamomile tea, and elderflower tea are cooling in their energy, so the person should avoid this and drink beverages such as ginger tea. Green tea is cooling, whereas black tea is more warming, which means the latter will be preferable for a person who is young deficient. In the same way that a person who is yin deficient should be careful not to challenge their yin in the evening by using computers, smartphones, and so on. A person who is young deficient should avoid straining their young in the morning. Therefore, a good way to start the day would be to eat hot partridge sprinkled with cinnamon instead of yogurt or cornflakes with milk. 
if they do not have a dumpling, a little cane sugar would also be good. A cup of black or ginger tea instead of cold orange juice will warm and support their spleen young in the morning instead of weakening it. Hot spices such as chili and cyanine pepper are not necessarily good because they make a person sweat and thereby lose chi. Rebuilding a deficient condition is something that takes time and cannot be forced. Therefore, making a small long-term changes is the best strategy. Light exercise, especially in the morning just after waking up, is recommended because it will activate the lethargic yang and qi. The person must, however, be careful that they do not exercise to the extent that they become fatigued or feel tired afterwards. This means that they should not run long distance, swim 30 lengths of swimming pool, or spend hours in the gym. Again, yoga, tai chi, and qigong will be better for them. They can also cycle or go for walks. As stated, it is important that they, be, they do not exhaust themselves and that they get enough rest. They will also benefit from a ginger or a mustard food bath. Thank you for your attention. Let's discuss chi stagnation with phlegm as a pattern in the depression. Clinical manifestations, depression, moodiness, and comfortable feeling in the throat, like a foreign body that cannot be coughed up or swallowed, difficulty in swallowing, sighing, feeling of oppression in the chest, hypochondrial pain, premenstrual tension, tongue, swollen body, possibly red sides, sticky coating, pulse is wiry or slippery. The ethereal soul residing in the liver is responsible for ideas, projects, life dreams, aims, creativity. The ethereal soul provides this movement on a mental and psychic level to the mind. And for this reason, the ethereal soul is said to be the coming and going of the mind. When the ethereal soul does not come and go enough, the person lacks dreams, aims, projects, inspiration, and creativity. He or she lacks a sense of direction and feels frustrated. These people are often at crossroads, which may have to do with relationships or work in life and lack a sense of direction. In short, the person is depressed. When chi stagnates over a long period of time, the free flow of chi in the triple burner is impaired, and this leads to impairment of metabolism of fluids. After time, this may result in the formation of phlegm. The coming and going of the ethereal soul may be restrained both by chi stagnation and by phlegm. Hence, the patient is depressed and lacks sense of direction in life. When, in addition to chi stagnation, there is phlegm, this clouds the mind's orifices and it leads to a certain loss of insight. The person feels confused and bewildered without being able to pinpoint what the trouble is. On a physical level, the clinical manifestations are centered on the throat and chest with a feeling of obstruction of the throat that comes and goes and the feeling of tightness of the chest. The pattern of chi stagnation with phlegm is more common in patients between 35 and 45. It is usually due to sadness, grief, worry, or shame. Treatment principle, resolve phlegm, move chi, eliminate stagnation. Points, stomach 40, REN 12, bladder 20, spleen 9, spleen 6, P5, TB6, P6, liver 3, REN 17, REN 15, DO 21, DO 20. All are needled with reducing or even method except for REN 12 and bladder 20, which should be reinforced to tonify the spleen. Stomach 40, REN 12, bladder 20, spleen 9, and spleen 6 resolve phlegm. In particular, stomach 40 resolves phlegm and calms the mind, and spleen 6 calms the mind. P5 resolves phlegm from the mind and opens the mind's orifices. TB6, P6, liver 3, and REN 17 move chi and calm the mind. TB6 is particularly indicated if there is hypochondrial pain. REN15 and DO21 open the mind's orifices and calm the mind. DO20 lifts mood. Thank you for your attention.